Okay, AP, hopefully this shouldn't be too long today because in our live session today, we are going to cover uh, the test results and the essay results. And that's what I would normally be doing if we were in a regular class. So that's taking up half of what I had planned. So that works out perfect for you. So uh, we're gonna get some things out of the way with the video though, because I just don't trust the technology uh, for those live meets. And the first thing is the essay. So this week's essay, is not really an essay in the traditional sense. Um, I told you that we're gonna introduce you to these different styles of essays. This uh, unit's essay is actually a list of 30 terms. And that is not, not something that they do on the AP exam. But it is something that I have picked up from, uh, about 15 years ago, I picked up from some other really good AP teachers that said it really showed students a different way to study and get ready for tests. And since a lot of times after the first test that you have to take without notes, it's a struggle, I thought this is a good time to introduce this. So we will do terms one time per quarter. It is not a format on the test, but it is a good study guide. There is one more type of essay format. You had the short answer in unit one. You had the typical, which is by far the most common uh, in unit two, just a prompt. And then we're eventually gonna learn I think two units from now about the DBQ, the toughest one. But the DBQ is so tough, I'm gonna give you like an easy DBQ, then a next quarter, a medium DBQ, and then eventually by third or fourth quarter, you'll have, I'll just steal one of the AP College Board's DBQs legally, of course, and give you that. So how do terms work? You have 30 people or events from the chapter. That's what your document will show. So, I'm gonna tell you right off the bat that some people love terms because you can do it in piecemeal. You know, you can say, oh, I've got time to do five before I go do this other thing or whatever. Uh, and some people hate it because it is tedious. It, you know, when you're writing a good essay, you get into a groove and it, then it just kind of goes fast. There's no groove to get into for terms. So you are just literally going to define or explain who these people are. It does need to be in a complete sentence. Um, one sentence, if really you know, well-crafted, will do it. It's certainly gonna be a compound sentence. Some people will need to write a, a couple of sentences, but let me tell you what is required for each thing. So, me and my near vision here, or far, far side this. Um, nationality, if it's a person, we need their nationality, profession, and significance. So if somebody is a British general, then you say, I mean, you can be concise and say, uh, this person was a British general who is most well known for, and then this major event, this big victory or this big loss, or it is, he is the French explorer. So I need the nationality and I need the profession. And then the thing that they're known for, oh, he's the French explorer who discovered whatever. So for people, again, Nationality, profession, significance. That can be done in one crafted, well, one well-crafted sentence. If it's an event, it's what is the event, obviously, and the significance of that event. So you wouldn't just say, there's a couple of things that are just like, define this. You wouldn't just say, oh, rack renting, definition is this. You say why it's significant to this particular chapter. There are some things that you could say, oh, they, depends on the context. They could be, a person could be significant for, you don't have this, but say Ben Franklin. If you had Ben Franklin, it would be in the context of the time period we're talking about here. You wouldn't say, oh, in this chapter, oh, he was very important in uh, negotiations with France during the revolution. We're not talking about the revolution yet. So you, you stick to the time period that we're talking about. The only other big thing that I will tell you is that I want it in your own words. So, you know, you can use whatever sources you want, but I'm gonna have a pretty good idea if you use the textbook solely. Now, if you do use the textbook, which is fine, that's what the textbook is for, put it in your own words. And if you cannot put it in your own words, then just directly quote it. Because if you directly quote it and then put in parentheses, Bailey, page 73 or whatever, that's fine, because you're not trying to pull anything over on me when you do that. If you wanna use another website, that's fine. But 
very famously, there's a description of one of the explorers where they call him intrepid. Okay, so that's an adjective that I think a lot of you might be familiar with, but some people invariably are not familiar with. And so when I read the third time, oh, this intrepid explorer, nope, you're copying because that was the exact same unique adjective that Bailey used. So put it in your own words, or if you feel like it's gonna to be too close, cite it, okay? That's all you've gotta do. So you've gotta do that for the 30 terms. The key is each one's worth one point. It's 30 points. There's no conversion for this. There's no nine point scale for this one. It goes in the grade book is 30 points. There's 30 terms. If you skip five, the best you can do is 25. Don't copy, pretty straightforward. This is due <clears throat> by the start of class next Friday. This is more of a typical uh, length of a unit. I guess it'd be seven days. Nine. Eight, I think, is the average, but we're getting closer. So if the terms are due next Friday, that means the test will be the following Monday. Okay? So that's kind of the pattern we follow. We are going to now start the chapter. Normally, uh, we would have gone over the test if we were in person here. We would have gone over the tests and maybe the essays, but we're going to save that for our live session. So we're going to start unit three, which is chapter five and six. And this is sort of a prep unit for really one of the biggest things that we teach in American history, the American Revolution. They're sort of setting the stage. They're setting the stage both uh, politically and sort of uh, socially, emotionally for what's going on. They make a point to say, and I think this is really interesting that Bailey brings this up. He says, you know, there are 32 colonies at this point for the British. We always say the 13 original colonies. We could say the 13 original states, but there's nothing original about these 13 colonies. We only think of them as the original colonies because it's us. The 13 colonies were all located more together, but the thing that unifies us, the thing that makes us unique is the tremendous population growth that we have. Some of those other colonies are stagnant in their population growth. All of the other colonies are low in their population growth, but not what will become the United States. In those 13 colonies, you have 300,000 British citizens in 1700. By 1775, 2.5 million. Boy, that is a lot of growth. And the other thing that makes that growth or that those colonies unique is the diversity. It's still something that makes what is now the United States unique. You know, if you go to Spain, and I'm teaching in a Spanish class for whatever reason, and I ask the class, what's your heritage? Most of them are gonna say, Spanish, duh. If I go to a French, you know, a class in France, and I ask these French students, what's your heritage? Most are going to say, French. Now there'll be a smattering here or there. In the United States, you know, we've got eight students in this class. You throw in me, so we've got nine people in the class. And I say, well, what's your heritage? Now, we probably each can say, oh, I kind of have these two or three things. Now, there's going to be a lot of crossover, but I would say we probably come up with at least 10 unique places, 10 places that our heritage is from. That's a very American thing. Not everybody is so diverse. I personally think it's a strength. I think most would agree it's a strength. Um, and this is starting way back at the beginning of our country. So they want to give you sort of a, a look at what's going on, a sort of, you know, socially and culturally. What is our makeup? We do speak at this time in the, you know, before the revolution, we're talking about mostly English speakers, but we are talking about pretty large percentage groups of minorities. So for example, Germans make up 6%. Germans make up 6% are very common in Pennsylvania, so common that street signs were printed in German and English. So you, you still hear people today who are upset that maybe, for example, you know, sometimes things are presented in English and Spanish. This is not unique to this time in American history. Because we are a nation of immigrants, we just have these phases where this group is prominent or that group is prominent. And so until that transition is made, you print things in two languages. It's not unique. Um, German, German settlements were so common in Pennsylvania that one particular area, which people still call it this, uh, was 
it was that area was called you know the Pennsylvania Dutch. And you go, well, how is German Dutch? It's not. It's because even then we were culturally ignorant sometimes. Um, the German word for Germany is Deutsch or the Deutschland. <laughs> when English ears heard Deutsch, they went, oh, they must be Dutch. And so that's where they're like, oh, those are the Pennsylvania Dutch. Nope, those are the Pennsylvania Germans. Um, the reason it's important to bring up these groups too is to go, I wonder how much loyalty to the British crown German immigrants have. Zero loyalty. Okay, Scots Irish that aren't really Irish, they're Scots. They're Scottish people that the British don't like and are bouncing around here or there. They make up 7% of the country. Uh, boy, do the Scots Irish, they not only don't have any loyalty to the British crown, they don't like the British crown. And so that's a pretty big group. Bailey makes a joke at the expense of the Scots. I don't know if you'll get it. Uh, the Scots Irish kept the Sabbath, which means they didn't work on Sunday, and everything else they could keep their hands on. He just called them thieves. How rude. They do not like the British government. There's another 5% sort of a hodgepodge mix of, let's see, French Huguenots, Welsh, Dutch, Swedes, Jews, Irish, Swish, not Swish, Swiss, Scots Highlanders, all of them, all of them, no loyalty to the British crown. And then you throw in 19 to 20% of uh, African slaves. They obviously have no loyalty to the British crown. So what you end up with is roughly 33% of the population of the colonies just is automatically born into no loyalty to the British crown. Then of course, in the ensuing chapters, things are gonna happen that will cause tension. And even some who are born loyal to the British crown obviously are going to pull away, add to that this group, and you've got enough for a revolution. Um, as far as diversity regionally, the South, on the one hand, has 90% of all of the, Af what would become African Americans. Now, other than that 90%, they're very non-diverse. But that, 90, that, that chunk of African Americans, it's a pretty big chunk. Uh, the least diverse region would have been New England because they came over as English families and they had lots of children and that, that they're very English in their stock. The most diverse, if we're not counting slaves, because of the forced nature of that, would be like Pennsylvania, where they were so open-minded and said, oh, come on in here. Um, so it's, it is a very diverse population at that time. Now, to sort of end, to end today, because again, the first day of the chapter is almost always just an intro, because we're usually spending time reviewing, setting up the next essay. I thought I'd go over some stats today about the United States, some, some just uh, demographics because I'm curious if you know your own country very well. Now, I've looked these up over the last few years and some are as old as, boy, some might be as old as eight years ago and some are as new as last year, but it gives you the basic idea of the United States. Life expectancy then in New England was 70. Today, uh, it is 78, 75 for men, 81 for women. Uh, there's a lot of jokes there. Uh, women, you're stronger, you're tougher. We all know that. Um, my grandpa used to like to tell the joke, you know why women live longer than men, because men live with women. Um, that's kind of funny, uh, but women, you live longer, so you get the last laugh. Uh, average age. This is amazing to me. If we go to the colonies, the average age was 16. What? That's insane. I don't know if there's a nation in the world right now that has such a low average age. The colonies were so young. They were having so many children, as Bailey would say. They were peopling at such an incredible rate. They have an average age of 16. Today, the average age is 37. That sounds more natural to me. If your average, if your life expectancy is, you know, somewhere in the 70s, 37 to 40 sounds about right. Ohio, it's a little bit older, 38. The oldest state is Maine, 42. The youngest state is Utah, 29. Uh, because of the, I think Utah is 85% Mormon, which we'll get to later. Uh, they, there's a religious element to children. Uh, I mean, I believe it is still encouraged to have as many children as you can uh, responsibly take care of. So that would explain that youth, youthful age. Here's some gross stats we don't have for the colonies, but we have for today. The average viewing time of TV, 
the average American watches four hours and 35 minutes of TV a day. Blown away by that. They must count when the TV's on. Because I know like my wife will, uh, if she's working in the kitchen, she'll have the TV on, but she's not watching. It'll be like on the news and, you know, but I don't know. That's what they say. 25% of Americans say they did not read a single book last year. Insane. Uh, but I might believe it. Population. Sometimes you guys are really bad at this stuff. Um, we have, I don't know if you know how many people we have. I've, I've heard some silly estimates before. We have 325 million people in the country, give or take. Now we have a census in 2020, so we should have a better idea but right around 325 million people. That puts us at, you know, for example, China's right, right around 1.2 billion. So we're, financially, we're, we're the biggest country in the world. Uh, Geography-wise, we're one of the biggest countries in the world. Population, we're not, we're not a small country by any stretch, but we are by no means the biggest. India is one or 1.1 billion, for example, so we're not the biggest nation by any stretch. 23% uh, of our nation is under 18, 14% uh, is over 65. Females make up about 51% of the population because they live longer. Uh, these throw people off. Um, this is very interesting to me. Um, There's some studies out there that say that we are not good at guessing what percentage of our population is what because we just assume where we live is reflective of the nation. So I find that very, very interesting. My children went to school in Norwalk where you have a larger Hispanic population. So Hispanic population in the United States is 17%. That's pretty big, but my kids estimated it at like 30. If I said, oh, what percentage of America do you think is this? And they said, oh, I don't know, 30%. And that's funny because when I ask my students in class in Sandusky, they have a tendency to say, I don't know, five or 10% because we all sort of think the world looks like our community and our community may, you know, obviously is gonna be different in each uh, part of the country. So African American population, 13.2%. Native American population, 1.2%. Uh, Asian, 5.3%. Uh, Pacific Islander, 0.2%. So uh, let's see, Caucasian, 62.6%. Foreign born, 13%. Language other than English spoken at home, about 20%. And that's over different time periods. That's been fairly consistent. It's just what language seems to change. Median household income. So all together, 53,000. Below the poverty level, about 15%. Um, number of TVs in your house, 54% have three or more. Insane. Um, and, but so do we. So whatever. Uh, Number of devices that can access the internet. Uh, let's see, 90% of us have three or more devices that can access the internet. This is never gonna be on the test. This is just to give you a snapshot of America. I just find this amazing. What percentage of marriages ended divorce? I mean, I just got on a statistic rant and just found this fascinating. 50%, I think most of us knew that. What percentage of, us, of second marriages ended in divorce? For some reason, I thought this would be lower in my head. It's higher, it's 67%. What percentage of third marriages end in divorce? Again, I thought, man, you're gonna know. You're gonna know, you know exactly what pitfalls to watch out for. Nope, 74% of third marriages end in divorce. Wow. Um, what year you get married, like your age, that was, go that was very low early on in our country's history and it has been on the rise ever ever since. Um, even you go back 26 years ago when I got married, I got married at 23 maybe, and very typical. Like all my friends were getting married between say 22 and 25. Today, the average age is 29. So that is definitely going up in that direction where it used to be not uncommon at all to get married right after high school. Uh, so those are some interesting stats for you to ponder. Not a big deal. The stats about the opening of, you know, sort of where we were as the colonies, very important. The other, just to give you some context to compare it to today. Okay. So look forward to our live session. We'll go over the really solid essays and what I hope to be good test results. See you guys.